Hello, everyone. This is me preempting myself to just give a quick update that the show that Nick Walker was starring in when we filmed this interview just a few short months ago here in the TFD offices, Ain't Too Proud, recently closed on Broadway. He has, however, announced that he will be making his return to the Broadway stage as Aaron Byrne Hamilton. We stan. So if you're interested in seeing Nick do what he does best on the stage, you can catch him doing that in Hamilton. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest episode of The Financial Confessions. It is I, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and person who just loves talking about money. And today we're talking about an aspect of money that for those who were in New York City last year or aware of New York City existing, um, was a pretty hot topic during the worst of the pandemic. As I'm sure everyone is aware, things shut down and nothing was shut down more than in-person experiences. That means things like concerts, that means things like sports, but it also means things notably like plays, theater, acting. Um, And just because you may not yourself be an actor does not mean that your broader economy is not impacted when these types of things are shutting down, at least here in New York City. City. It's not just the theaters themselves that are closed and all of the people who work on these shows out of work. It's also all of the restaurants, coffee shops, bars, stores around these parts of the city that depend on that traffic. Like we have in New York City an entire like dinner service schedule that is centered around the idea of people going to shows after getting food. So we heard a lot about actors and all of the other people who make plays and theater and live experiences happen being out of work. You might have seen fundraisers. You might have seen you know, charity drives, even galas, things like that to raise money for these people. But we didn't often talk to these people about what it really looked like for everything to be shut down. And I think part of that might be because we rarely talk to people in entertainment industries about what it's actually like for them financially the rest of the time. Because as you can probably imagine, even when things are not shut down, even when business is booming in places as lucrative as Broadway is, that does not always trickle down to everyone who's a part of making these shows happen. So I wanted to find someone to talk about not just what it looked like to be an actor last year, but also what it looks like to be in this industry in all times, including some of the most lucrative ones. Luckily, I have an internet friend who, in addition to being a Broadway star himself, is also unusually candid about all of these topics and willing to talk. He's currently starring in Ain't Too Proud to Beg on Broadway. He formerly played Aaron Burr in Hamilton. He was also in Peter and the Star Catcher. You might have also seen him on Law and Order SVU. The man has been around, and today he's in the TFD office, not too far from where he's about to go do a show just later today. His name is Nick Walker. Welcome to our studio. Thank you so much for having me in this wonderful studio. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, So currently, as I mentioned, you're starring in Ain't Too Proud to Beg. um, And that is a show in which it's it's sort of, what do they call them, a jukebox musical? Jukebox, yeah. So it's, yeah, Ain't Too Proud. And it's so funny because, like, it's you want to say the whole thing. Like, everyone's always like, Ain't Too Proud to Beg. But it's like, ain't, ain't too, too proud. proud. They just keep it short. Uh, yeah, it's a jukebox musical uh, about the life and times of the Temptations. In fact, I believe that is the subtitle of the show, is The Life and Times of the Temptations. Uh, and it's it's really a beautiful project. So often, I think, on Broadway, one of the things, you know, you talk about kind of the, the meeting of commerce and art, right? So you want to, especially on Broadway, where, you know, this is kind of this mecca of the of, of New York. You, you want to both do things that are both artistically uh, valuable, but also catch the eye of tourists as they come in. And I think one of the things I'm so proud of uh, with this show um, is that it kind of finds a balance of both, right? You you do get this these, this, these songs that everyone knows and this group that everyone knows, but our book writer, Dominique Morisot, who um, is a brilliant mind, a highly lauded and awarded mind, did this wonderful thing where she was like, cool, I'm going to give you the story of the Temptations, but really I'm going to give you the story of five young black men living through the civil rights movement. And they happen to be Temptations. And so that's really what our story kind of kind of takes from is just that experience that, you know, for better or worse, is very relevant to today. Um, so yeah, Ain't You Proud is, is a, a good home to have for sure. 
Man, and you really undersold it when you, because so we've like followed each other on social media for a while and he like messaged me on Twitter and was like, oh, I'm, I'm in a show, um, you know, I can, you know, grab you seats if you'd like to come see it. And in my mind, I'm expecting you to like walk across the stage for five minutes because I mean, you know, listen, we live in New York. We meet a lot of actors. They don't usually like star in shows. And if they do, that is the first thing you'll ever hear from them. And so like you... You never leave the stage during this show. I do not. <laughs> You're narrating it. You're in every number. Like, you yeah. basically are the show. So, A, hats off for being humble. But, B, how do you physically do it, like, four or five times a week? Still figuring that out. And uh, especially, so what's what's kind of amazing, you know, if there is a silver lining to the pandemic, which the, there might not be. We are, let, let us see. Um, but one of the things that is amazing is that coming back, we uh, were coming back to a seven-show schedule. So, usually, we're on an eight-show-a-week wow. schedule. Um, this uh, time around, at least for the first couple of months, it's been seven shows a week, which has been super helpful just as our bodies, especially for this show, as our bodies readjust, as our minds readjust to this thing. Um, so that has been kind of a nice aid to be like, cool, okay, I'm not doing what I, what I was doing previous. Uh, this is kind of a, in some regards a break. Um, in other regards, not so much, especially because we're adding that eighth show back next week. So by the time this airs, we will be back on an eight show schedule, uh, wow. and that will be a thing. Um, but you know, I think that what it comes down to is, uh, is discipline. Um, and you know, and that's something I know you talk often about on both this pod and your, your channel, but just, just what it means to be disciplined um which i'm again still figuring out but what i do know is you're not you're not necessarily living like a monk but you are very aware that the your day is centered around three to six hours right so everything you do previous and after those three to six hours has to in some way you know not hinder you during those three to six hours so if it's a two-show day um i'm i'm i mean i'm rarely going out after the show, if I am going out, I'm going to a chill bar, generally a place that does not have loud music. Uh, I'm really not hanging with more than two or three people, uh, especially in COVID times, you know, because we are, we do have to maintain a bubble as a cast, right? Like, I'm probably going outside, so it's probably some, you know, there's a place I go that has this wonderful outdoor trolley um, with like heaters and stuff that so many places are doing. But then it's also, as we were talking about before, uh, we start recording what you eat. Right. So yeah. I'm, I'm not like I, you know, my wife will tell you uh, I have the, the mind of a 10 year old often about things. If you come up to my dressing room, it's all comic books and movie posters and oh. superhero stuff. I literally, you know, I'm a child uh, and I also love sugary cereals. I love those things. Uh, the, the fans send me boxes of sugary. Like I have maybe 12 boxes of Cap'n Crunch just lined up on my shelf. Good cereal. Great cereal. Uh, does not cut the roof of your mouth. But can't it eat. does, but that's why it's good. Continue. Uh, it, it, agree, agree. Actually, agree. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I agree with that. Uh, but but can't eat that every day no. as much as I would love to. Uh, it's really, you know, protein and vegetables and a lot, a lot, a lot of water and electrolytes. Um, I also have a, a great team on the stage with me. So it starts with my dresser, Marissa, who is basically like, like my savior because um, I also have asthma. Right, so doing the show in a cold, dry theater, especially now, you know, during the pandemic, uh, like there are so many nights when, like, I come off during intermission, and I'm just like, <gasps> right. So she has my emergency inhaler. The two times that I do step off stage for a quick change, which is literally like about five people ripping my clothes off and putting clothes on and shoving water in my mouth and pushing me back out on stage. She has uh, ginger chews for me. She has a lozenge for me. Um, anything that I could need, possibly Gatorade. They sneak me uh, Powerade, coconut water, like in little moments on the stage. So all those, all those things combine into into doing the show, uh, uh, seven shows a week. I've only called out once so far. Knock on wood. There's no wood here, so let's do this. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, it's all right. It's all right. It's fine. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's yeah. It definitely is. You kind of you're kind of adjusting. Uh, how you are operating in the world, um, which is not a bad thing. It's just something you, you have to kind of get used to day by day. Yeah. Now, I'm curious 
about so obviously I mean you as you said you have to have uh, an extremely high level of discipline I could never I just like <laughs> the cereal alone I love cereal mm-hmm. my beloved fiberglass Captain Crunch yes, um, yes I could never give that up but I also imagine that being in um, a role that has so much physicality is so visible um, that it must kind of put you in a weird space with your physical appearance in Mm -hmm. terms of, you know, wanting to be in perfect shape all the time, you know, being very aware of what you look like, this, that, and the other. And obviously coming out of the pandemic where a lot of people were sitting at home all day, I think a lot of people developed a sort of strange relationship with their bodies, but I imagine all the more so when you're now getting back onto stage eight nights a week or eight times a week. So how has that been um, in general and specifically coming out of the pandemic? Ooh, we could write a book on that. It's well, and it's it's interesting, right? Because so you have to understand. So I'm my resume is mostly musical theater at this point, mostly Broadway. But I never studied musical theater, right? I was a Shakespeare major in school, so I was around actors, and 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 that what was wonderful about that was the idea of all shapes and sizes and and just just people, right? And I and I I say that with a caveat of I also went to NYU, which brings its own, you know, I love that school. That is, I'm also an adjunct at that school, but it, it comes with a litany of socioeconomic questions. Um, so to was, say the least. To say the least. Was I, you know, a real estate firm that happens to teach classes. Uh, was I, <laughs> was I, was I the, the token of that, of my class? Absolutely. Right. So I wasn't seeing a lot of people who looked like me just mm. physically, aesthetically. That has now changed in so many ways, which I'm so proud of. But I say all this to say when you get into Broadway, when you start booking these musicals there, you know, and you see the dancing ensemble, you see people who really do movement for their lives. Um, the amount of insecurities and and just triggers that hit you, because these are people who their bodies are literally built to do this. And I'm coming out of a thing where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, just like just relax into yourself. And, you know, you have to, you look your best, but like it's not about having the abs and it's not about having the biceps. It's just who are you and what do you want to present? And then you get to this sector of, of acting and you're like, wow, y'all are just like like just Adonis, 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 Adonis. Uh, and what does that mean? So you're already judging yourself. I think the thing that I'm so proud of and too proud for doing is that prior to the pandemic, Um, or not prior to the pandemic, prior to us coming back um, about six months out when we knew that we, what our reopening date was. um, The company sat down, the cast, we we all got together outside of our union, right? And we were just like, cool. So we're coming back. We are a building of 90% black performers trying to do a show um, in this time. On the very basic level, what do we need to feel safe coming back in this building? And one, and so we made kind of a list, a a, a list that we sent to our producers. um, And we're just like, hey, here are the things we're thinking about. And our producers are amazing people. And I don't just say that because they're my bosses. I I, I really mean that. They, because there's so many producers who wouldn't have done this. Our producers were listening to everything we listed. And one of the things that we listed was there can be no comment on what our bodies look like coming out of this. There's just none. And, and and not that it would have been acceptable previous, but especially now, if you if you need us to look a certain way, right, we understand that we are playing historical characters who looked a certain way, fine, but that is an encouragement and not a like not a, a, a descending on us with criticism. Like right. or, or, or passive aggressive anything. That's hey, we have a you know, we previous we had a, a membership at Equinox, so get that back. Uh, you know, uh, give us a health stipend if you can. Um, you know, how can you encourage us to take care of ourselves as opposed to, you know, exposing us as having not taken care of ourselves? And that is something that has happened. So I think on the very basic level, we have attacked this in this time as something of like, let's just be empath- empathic and human and genuine and kind and not not make anyone feel ashamed for what, where, because whatever their body is doing, it took care of them. If they walk, if they're walking back into the building, they are alive, right? Which in the past two years is a massive statement. Uh, So can we just appreciate that? And our producers and our creative team were all extremely on board with that. Um, And and not just about the physical appearance. We, we, We had mental health professional, we had 
uh, EDI consultants, we we really were like, let's try. EDI. So uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, Pink Cornrows was the was the firm that came in, uh, run by a wonderful woman um, named Ify, uh, who is just the best and uh, not corporate in the best sense of the word, just really trying to bridge human connection. Um, and so we were able to just have honest talks about how we felt coming back into this mm-hmm. building. Um, so that's been huge. Yeah, I, I have to be honest, before pre-pandemic, I followed a fair amount of, not even specifically Broadway, but like, I don't know how I ended up with like a bunch of like dancers and mm-hmm. like stuff like that on my Instagram. And I was like, who know? Because like, even if before, I, I shouldn't have been following this before, but after I certainly don't need like pictures of someone with like a 12 pack on my feed, like Dude. in between pictures of cookies. Like just, I don't need that in my life. There's a there's a guy, uh, you talked about my time in Hamilton. There's a guy uh, in Hamilton named Thane Jasperson. Thane, if you're watching this, I hope you know I'm talking about you. I'm about to call you out in the best way. I'm so sorry, but I also don't care. Thane has the body literally of Hercules. And this, I do not Uh understand it. He also, you will find him in his dressing room eating tubs of chocolate ice cream. Like when I say, like when I say actual, like just, and, 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 and like cookies and cakes and pies. And I just hate you, Thane. I hate Thane your guts. Thane is canceled. Thane is canceled. None of us need you. <laughs> oh my I'm so God. glad that that got said. Thane Jasperson, you're gone. Man, you're going out. to Schmackery's, the real Broadway institution. Oh, it actually is. And it's, it's really it's really fascinating because like Schmackery's, there, there's, a, there's a tradition of- A cookie shop on, a, off Broadway. Yes. And it's, and it's a wonderful cookie shop. We love it here. And if you ever, uh, I'll say one of the Broadway traditions is if anybody ever has a good date, let's say, let's say that's, that's the PC way of saying it, uh, not the PC, the- the, the nice way, you, you have a responsibility then that next day to bring in schmackeries uh, or Krispy Kreme. It can also be Krispy Kreme. This is implied it's a sleepover. It is a sleepover. It's a very nice, there's a lot of Cap'n Crunch involved. Oh my gosh. Involved. Um, okay, you mentioned the union, you mentioned Hamilton. Yes. Crack these knuckles. Let's it's go. It's time to talk about money. Boom. So you were in Hamilton for how long? Uh, all told about almost four years. Whew. And safe to say it was like the biggest musical at yes. that time. I mean, it probably still is. Yes. What did you make? So to answer this question, I'm going to answer it in, in the years that I was in it. Because so understand that I started in Hamilton as an ensemble member covering George Washington, Mulligan Madison, and Aaron Burr. So I was in the Broadway company as uh, the understudy for those roles. Um, my, my ensemble track Man Six uh, was known as the Ninja Track uh, because literally, you, you like to this day, if you can spot Man Six on the stage, I will actually give you five dollars. It, it like there's no way you're never gonna. It, it is a one. I love that track. It is one hundred percent a track that's that's there to support vocally the show, um, right? Because it's not a dancer track. The ensemble of that show is very much about dancers. Um, and, and so it's there to support vocally and to understudy these big roles. Um, so when I was in Hamilton, I was getting, right, you, you do, depending on what the show is, right, our union has a minimum for a production contract. A uh, production contract is basically anything, anything that's on Broadway right now is on a production contract, um, right? It's, it's the biggest contract we have. Um, it, it handles the, the shows with the most capital. Um, and there's a minimum to that, which is about 1900. I believe we, we, and it's, it's actually a little over that. I'm not thinking of the exact number in my head. Per show. Per, uh, per week. Per week. 1900 okay. per week. So you are getting, uh, that, that is Broadway minimum and that's uh, where often ensemble sits, but then you get, if you have any sort of, um, like, you know, it's like hazard pay, right? If you're doing something that's particularly, dangerous or a special skill, you get bumps for that. If you are understudying, you get bumps for that. It used to be the type of thing where when you were understudying, uh, you would get that, that you get those bumps as your base pay and then every time you went on for them, it used to be that you'd get an eighth of the, of the, act, of the principal actor's salary for that show that you covered them for. Um, now it's, it's, a, it's a different rate. Um, it's a different number, and I'm not exactly, to be honest with you, not exactly sure how that number is calculated. Um, but you do get a, a fee on top of yours for every time you go on. So it sounds like the base for that track is about sixty-three grand a year or something like that. Yeah. Mm. Nineteen hundred. Like, that's 
Yeah, you're. It's a. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, oh, right, because there's, there's yeah. four like, weeks in a month, you idiot. Yeah, <laughs> oh so my you, god. You're, you're about. You're about. I think 120 yeah. actually. So like 120 for ensemble. 120 for ensemble. So it's wow, wait, which is great. Like if you if you join a Broadway show, and you're on a production contract, um, mo you are making six figures to to start, which is amazing. You get two weeks of vacation time, um, and you're as an ensemble member, you have paid sick days. Uh, as a principal actor, you do not. Um, so every day that you are sick, if you may, depending on how much you make, every day that you are sick, an eighth of your salary, of your weekly. So, so it behooves you not to be sick. I guess probably the logic there is that you're a big part of the draw. You yes. Um, and people are going to be pissed if they're seeing an understudy, which yes. sucks for the understudies. Well, it's horrible, and that's that's one thing that I do want to say. Understand that understudies are are very much the quarterbacks of Broadway. Sure. Both in plays and musicals, and I think there's a stigma there that like, oh, I'm seeing the understudy. You're un I started as an understudy. Like, you, you will these people will one day be leading their own shows. There's there, you know, I mean, like it the 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 mental capacity that it takes to do what they're doing um, is gargantuan, and you know, I think that understand that like, yeah, maybe they don't get as much rehearsal time, uh, you know, in in that role um, because they have anywhere from five to 10 other roles in their head um, at any given time. But they are doing the best they can in the craziest of circumstances because we're not even talking about split tracks. You know, I mean, split track meaning a time when you are, you know, on for one role and then maybe halfway through you have to switch to another role because that person gets hurt. Um, do you mean like it's, there's so many circumstances in which understudies really make every, earn every cent that they make. So, um, so you studied it. You started at like one, like just over six figures. Yes. By the time you were done, like at the top of your Hamilton yep. career, what were you making? Uh, about six hundred thousand a year. Ooh, buddy. Yeah. Take that, finance bros. Take that. And they actually earn it. We we, um, we work. We work hard. You work. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So now, mm -hmm. unions are great, right? Yes. Unions. Let's all get one. Let's all um, do it. Is my is my take. But so two questions about the union specifically. Yes. Number one, when you're in the union, so I assume you're. This is now a union show as well. Is there transparency between everyone about what everyone's making? And then question two is: Are there non-union Broadway shows? These are both great questions. Uh, so I'll answer two first. No. Um, if you are stepping on that stage. You are absolutely on a Broadway stage, right? In 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 anywhere in uh, you know between 50, 54th and Fortieth Street, uh, between in between Hell's Kitchen and you know Bryant Park, uh, you are on a union stage, um, and it will and it will be a big problem if if you're not. Uh, so that is a great thing. Right. And we just, you know, for, for, and this is something to discuss. We, we, you know, our union just opened up membership, like our, you know, to everyone. It was, it was, there used to be a certain number of weeks that you had to, um, uh, had to have worked, but now they, they kind of opened the doors. Uh, I, I forget what the exact program is called, uh, to get just union members in. And part of that, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of benefit to that. I think, uh, you know, trying to eke, you know, just equalize the the socioeconomic advantages that some people have because acting is not something that you just jump into. It very much depends on what school you went to and who you know and all these things. Access, um, but also we just went through a pandemic, and I and I, I know that there are you know I'm, I'm sure there are financial concerns about we need to just up membership because we need dues, um, you know, and not that's I don't even think of that as callous. I, th I just think that that's a reality. Um, so I, I'm not putting words in their mouths. I just imagine that that's part of the calculation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you're stepping on union, if you're stepping on a Broadway stage, you are part of the union for sure. Um, first question: transparency. Transparency. Members of the show. That is something that we are working on and trying to change. The minimums are transparent. Okay. But the the. Right. So a show, the success of a show, you want to do a Broadway show. You're a producer. You want to put on a Broadway show. First of all, you're probably just 10% insane because it, it, it is a gamble. 
right? You are literally rolling the dice. There is no way to guarantee that the amount of money that it takes to put the show up will be recouped. Mm -hmm. There's just no way. Um, so you, you're already jumping into something that is just uncertain on so many terms. Um, so you are, uh, you know, depending on where you start with the capital, how many, you know, the amount of investors you're able to get, when the theater opens, right? Because you're also in competition. You, there are so many shows trying to get into these theaters. There are three, three main organizations that own these theaters. So you're, you're very much vying for a spot. And you also are vying not just to get into the theaters, but you want a, a theater that suits your show. Right. Right. Uh, some, some, sh some people need it or no, some shows need more intimate space. Depending on that, you are able to pay your actors different salaries, different scales. Um, so a show like Hamilton, which is now a massive success, is absolutely able to pay, uh, you know, over half a million dollars uh, to to an Aaron Burr or a Hamilton. Um, that is not the case with all shows. And I think that one of the things that has happened is, for you know, it has become kind of a whether intentional or not, a way to control actors in, in the industry in terms of like not knowing what other people are making next door, not knowing, right? Because it, if, if nobody has financial literacy, right, then nobody knows what to ask for and everyone's concerned for their jobs if they make too much, too many waves. And I think that's one of the great things that is changing. And that's one thing that our producers have all, that Ain't Too Proud producers and Hamilton, uh, Jeffrey Seller, who is just a, a truly incredible person, um, have always been, uh, you know, fighting for is is just more openness, more honesty, more clarity. Um, On your show, do you guys know what each other, the others make? Um, yes, but not because, yes, but our sh but because we made a point to. Mm. We made a point to be like, let's let's be clear. So so uh, there there's another principal actor in the show who uh, this is one of their first Broadway shows. Uh, this is their first Broadway show. This is Broadway debut. Um, and all throughout his negotiation, right? So we, we have our reps, we have our agents, our managers, our publicists, whatever. Um, but all throughout his negotiation, we were on the phone. Hey. Hell yeah. Right, Be just because it's like- You call that solidarity. Absolutely. I, I want you to know what I'm, what I'm getting, why I'm, why I'm getting it. Um, and then you are able to better position yourself. And even if, even if you don't get what you want, you can at least know what that means for you. It's all about, clarity is choice, right? Would you share what you're making on your current show? Absolutely. So right now, they have me at, depending on the box office, it slides, right? So if my if the box office is over a certain percentage, then I get uh, about $500 more per week. Okay. Um, so right now, I'm at 5000 a week. Um, if the box office goes over... I'm forgetting the percentage, but then I will be at 5,500. Um, that changes, that that switches at the six month mark. Okay. So then we'll go up. So so it's like 300 grand a year. What is my math? Is my math terrible? A little, yeah. 240. 240. Okay. Yeah. So like it could range between like, you know, two and three basically, mm -hmm. depending on the box office. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although I imagine if you guys are going back up to eight shows a week, it's probably not doing too bad. It's it's really, that's the, again, the, the blessing here. I'm so thankful. Um, because it didn't have to go this way, you know, and especially because January is this drop off month, right? You, you had the holidays are so special because everyone's in town and everyone wants to see a show. And then as soon as you hit January, you're just dealing with New York. I'm seeing like six shows. I'm going to single handedly keep the lights on on Broadway. Keep it on. Keep Come it on. see me there anyway. No, in but the the, audience. it's the truth. And it's, it, it, we really, it is so appreciated when, you know, because it is this thing of like, that's when you really know. And I think that Ain't Too Proud is, you know, again, I, there's no guarantees in this business, not at all. But Ain't Too Proud is set up in a really great way where we do have, you know, a great marketing team. Uh, the show was selling super well. You know, so previous to the pandemic, they used to release um, the, the grosses uh, of the shows weekly. Like you could see, you could really, and it was helpful for us because we could track how our show was doing. Mm -hmm. Ain't Too Proud pre-pandemic was always a million or above. A per week, per week. week. Whoa. Do you mean like so so that that's amazing. Now now, again, just for context, Hamilton two. Two million. But still, I mean half of Hamilton, I mean, Hamilton is like an institution. Hamilton. At this point. And and but but understand that like it took 
it, it wasn't always. My parents saw it before it was on Broadway. Yeah, at they the public. Won- yeah, downtown. And yeah, right. So it it was a it was a it was a gamble. It was a gamble, and it's hard to think about now. But it was a gamble. All these things were a gamble. So I get it, and I think that the only way forward is clarity of communication, just just so that we understand what this is, what this in just just for us, those of us in the industry, to understand what it is that we're dealing with. Because I think that. Mm-hmm. For all the guts and glory of like, oh yeah, you're you're making money. It's also like, yeah, but your show's got to stay open. Does the, do you get like, do you get like a four hundred one k? Mm-hmm. So well, the, well, the insurance is through how many work, weeks you work, right? And this is what's interesting though, because or so no, that's interesting. So many, well, no, no, but so many of us are incorporated, and so then we still like. So I started with four hundred one k, but now that I'm incorporated, obviously can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so that becomes a whole other conversation. Um. And again, fortunate to be in a position where incorporation makes sense for me in this industry. Um, but it is something that we have then had to, every time that you know tax season comes around, it's always that question of, yeah, how much are you going to put away into this? And you know, can you lower your tax bracket by doing that? And it's just like... Oh, wait. Yeah. So you're 1099 with these companies. Oh, so you're actually not an employee of any of these shows. You're a contractor with them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, so clearly you're probably, I mean, you're headlining one of the bigger shows on Broadway. Mm-hmm. I mean, this man is that show. Go see it. It's like crazy. He, he never leaves the stage. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're still probably even, you know, in the best case, about half what you were for Hamilton, which makes sense, right? Hamilton makes twice as much money, you know, even on a bad day, probably. Yeah. It's just. It's Hamilton. That Lin-Manuel, man. <laughs> He he can write them. Um, but anyway, so that's a big delta for anyone, you know, even though, you know, making two to three hundred grand a year is still way more than the vast majority of Americans and you're in a two income household. That is still to go down a hundred per, or fifty percent rather. Um did you prepare for that? How do you live differently? Like, talk, walk us through the process of that. So this is where I get to really uh, do my favorite part of this interview, which is to just uh, plug my wife as a brilliant, brilliant, wonderful person. We love a wife guy. Um, oh, abs- always. That's that's my best friend and, and the person that I'm uh, aspiring to be in so many ways. And I th- and um, it, so. Again, wrapped up in so many things. I'll try to make this as concise as possible. Yes, there was preparation in going that. And and knowing why I was making that choice, right? Um, For me, right, so I I started on Hamilton Broadway, and then I took Hamilton out on the road as Aaron Burr. And, um, right, the road is amazing, and I got to see so many amazing things and places and people. But my family's at home. I need to come back home. Um, Hamilton at that point didn't have an opening on the like their burr uh daniel breaker was going to stay um and there's and at this point at that point too there was you know there's so many burrs right because there's five i think now six or maybe seven companies of hamilton so like i'm not the only burr right like when i when i started out as burr there was only three three companies now there's like six or seven so there's people there's a whole list of people trying to you know just trying to continue their lives and continue their careers and get back to new york or stay on the road or whatever they want to do so hamilton right so there's broadway company which is kind of like think of it like the flagship store right that's you come to you know uh, 40 46th street on at the richard rogers theater that's where it started and then uh they open tours right national tours so you have um the one that started in i believe it was uh san fran are started in Seattle, and those are companies that tour around. Then at pre-pandemic, you also had some sit-downs. So you had Chicago. There was a company that was just in Chicago. Um, there's a West End company right across the pond. There's now also an Australian company. Um, I believe there's about to be a German company. Um, so there's there's all sorts of, like there's literally other stores. Of hand- it's it, like franchises, it's basically. And the franchise. company is the cast. Yes. And the cast, the crew, the right. orchestra, everyone. And I th- and, and two, again, I think one of the one of the most amazing things about Hamilton, speaking, you know, um, Lynn, I love you. Uh, thank you for everything. Uh, is is that it, it, the, sta- it, the staying power is ridiculous. You know, when they released the Disney Plus movie, the question was, well, so if people can see it here, why would they come to the... The, the brilliance that they have is that they, they're not asking anyone to replicate what happened in the Disney Plus. So you see the Disney Plus movie, 
that's an entirely different cast and an entirely different take on the show. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you're like, you go to any one of these franchises, you're going to get six to seven different takes on the show to its credit. Plus, I, I, they, I don't know if they've done studies on this, but I would imagine people seeing this at home actually increases the ticket sales. Yes, I, I, I have to imagine. And, I, and I, think, I think they're very smart with how they push the show. So it all comes down to that, right? This, this idea that, you know, I was part of this thing that was truly the biggest part of my life, but I wasn't at home. Yeah. Um, Ain't Too Proud opened up. Ain't Too Proud was a, it was a story I cared about. Um, it was a, it was a cast that I loved. Um, some of these people in this cast, I, I started my Broadway career with. So Jawan Jackson, who plays Melvin Franklin, who's the bass, right? He's got the most ridiculous voice in the world. He does. He's, he's out of control. He's also a knucklehead and I hate his guts. Uh, but we started, we literally made our Broadway debuts together in 2011, right? So that's 10 years of friendship, um, right? The, the, it was, it was, and the story is so powerful. And even this connection, the director of this, Des Mackinoff, um, uh, he also directed Jersey Boys. Uh, he all, I mean, he's, he's directed so many things. Um, Des was my college best friend's godfather. Hmm. So like I, I knew this man like w way back in the day. Um, and and he, and he he's the reason I have a career. So there were so many just personal reasons to come home, um, even with the pay cut. Um, it was also the chance to, you know, first replacement on a Broadway show. This is a Tony-nominated role. This is a, a massive role. Um, this is a role that, that gets a lot of exposure. Mm -hmm. So that, that was absolutely part of the calculation. But it was like, cool, you know, we are fine. You know, there's, there are reasons to supplement the the financial loss there were there were reasons and obviously most important of those was getting home to my wife and my cat um right That's so cat guy. cat guy so but here's here's what happens right my wife um who is the really the reason that i learned about you and your your amazing operation like truly my you know she is someone i think who is able to deal with her any traumas that come up in such a, 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 a an objective way you know I you know my family as a whole I you know I my mother is my other hero she is absolutely the person that I look up to and want to be um, I did not gain the financial literacy and I put that on me right that was some money was not something that we often talked about that was, and that's not her fault um, it, it's very much just something that kind of got lost. And I think that she was working so hard to provide for me mm -hmm. that, you know, it just wasn't a conversation that I even thought to ask. I was just so like thankful of like, oh my God, you know, the, the, uh, the road is clear. The path, you know, she literally has paved a path for me. I didn't have any student loans. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I went to NYU. I was, you know, that's $200,000. Didn't have any student loans. Do you mean like that's the kind of mother I had? So I was just grateful and didn't, and also just didn't want to rock the boat, didn't think to ask. So I'm coming into this thing very much like I, I don't know. And when money gets mentioned, I seize up. That's not my wife. My wife is somebody who says, cool, let's plan. Let's figure this out. And so on when I was on tour, she was very much about... Um, Going back to your episode, I think from like five years ago when you talked about uh, just the just how to formulate a budget, oh. right? And we start, you know, starting there. A deep cut. Deep cut. Listen, those deep cuts mean a lot. And starting there, and really just being like, cool. So what is what is it that you're going to be bringing in, breaking down the 50, 30, 20, and you know, adjusting as we need. Um, and that's how we did it uh, initially. Now here's where the pandemic comes in, because when I was shifting from Hamilton to Ain't Too Proud was December to February of 2019-2020. So we, we shift and then all of a sudden my show closes. And so we are like, what? And then Sarah gets into grad school in San Diego. And so we're like, what? So the to, to budget as an actor is so hard as it is because you literally it's not a i am literally in an unstable work environment at all times and you're like basically as high as anyone's ever going to get in broadway and it's still unstable it's still unstable and and even like and and that goes for all forms of 
performing arts. I think that's one of the things that is so ridiculous and why we need to have these conversations because you could be you could be starring in a TV series right now and for whatever reason and especially on TV where it's not just about, you know, I think theater Broadway is such a collaborative art form. TV film is is also a beautiful art form, but it also is I mean it is big money. Like we're you know, we're I think we're uh, what 17 somewhere around 17 billion on Broadway. That's like the output of our industry into the into New York, I believe. But that's nowhere compared to TV. I mean, they are that's that's an insane industry that spans the entire country. For to come see us, you have to come to a very specific city at a very specific time. Yeah, but it's way better. It let's I I love I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but I will say, right? Like it is is the kind of thing that you really have to be aware of. You could be doing this contract and the next day it's gone, whether your show gets canceled or you get written off the, sh- the TV series or whatever. Or, you know what I mean? Like life happens, especially in the arts and entertainment sector. So saving becomes extremely important. Financial literacy becomes extremely important. And for a person who was scared of, of broaching that, our, our financial conversations were incredibly difficult until extremely recently. Um, it was the kind of thing where she was very much pushing for uh, these conversations and my triggers and traumas with not only not having the words for it, but also not wanting to say the wrong thing and look stupid are preventing me from engaging in this conversation. And there's a lot of gender stuff in there too, because typically it's the man who's going to be, you know, the one who takes care of money, even though we know that's not that's not true at all, right? No. Like, like that, and that's the so there's all these things that are just preventing me from having a real, genuine conversation, and not and not something that is project where I'm projecting my shame onto it, or projecting my guilt onto it, or projecting my fear onto it. That took a long time, and my wife had to deal with a lot of BS to get to that place. I can only imagine, listen, you don't have to answer this because you're in the show, no, no, no. but I can only imagine, listen, you do it eight times a week, almost every week for God knows how long. There's got to be some times when you're up there and you're like, you're belting your head off, but you're like going over your grocery list in your head. There are absolutely times when I am <clears throat> not even going over my grocery list, but I will say thinking about like, holy crap. I have like, like literally when I, there are times when like 20 minutes into the show, 20 minutes into my three hour never leave the stage show, and I realize like how many more things I have to do on that stage. And I'm just like, nope. Oh my God. It's like, a, well, it has that feeling of like being a workout where you're like, I gotta do like 60 more crunches before it's I can like, yeah. Literally a hit routine. It's a it's a, it's a a three hour hit routine every day or six, six, uh, six out of the seven days. But I say this is a perfect example. So we just did the Kennedy Center Honors. Um, and that's, it was an amazing thing. Um, once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, I also have, you know, you're talking to someone who has social anxiety and like I said, ADHD. Um, and with this big after party afterwards. And it's like every, you know, this year was honoring Bette Midler and Barry Gordy. And that's why we were there and Lauren Michaels and Joni Mitchell and all these amazing people. So you have like, when I say like people that you just see on every poster and everything, you know, at the after party, just like talking to you, come up to you, like we're, you know, we're all, everyone's connecting. Within five minutes, I was like, mm, not for me. And I literally went to Crown and Crow, which is my favorite DC bar. Uh, like Crown and Crow. Crown and Crow. I used to love at DC. Oh, oh, I love Crown and Crow. It's my favorite. It's and great. I literally just got a Guinness and sat there and wrote. And that was like my happiness for the night. Hell yes. And, and, and I say that to say like, that is why I'm not in, like that part's wonderful. That's not why I'm there. I'm there because this is the way that I fully express myself. If it ever was not, time to get out. Totally. Well, I, and I said the like grocery list thing yeah. because, you know, so I've published two books. Mm-hmm. Th- they have almost nothing to do with the kind of creative writing that I enjoy. Yeah. They're, and, you know, the, the process of publishing is just soul crushing. And that's for a successful book. Yeah. Um, and the, the writing that I do that is um, fun and expressive is, I, it will almost certainly never earn any money, but I think it's almost better that it doesn't earn any money. And I think the term hobby can have almost a negative connotation to it or a condescension to it. 
But I think it's for me, it's more about diversifying your sense of identity and your yes. sense of validation and yes. decoupling it from money. Yes. Because ultimately, whatever kind of performing art you're in or creative endeavor you're in, anything that you're in that is almost statistically unlikely to ever earn you a solid living, I'm sorry, but at a certain point, it may not feel this way at 25, but trust me at 40, Yes. The feeling of financial stability and the freedom, because it's also time. Money is time. Yes. The time to enjoy the parts of it that you love um, and the release of that pressure of constant financial struggle is going to be worth more to you yes. than the feeling of being paid exclusively through whatever it is that you want to be doing. Yes. And 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 to that end, it's, you know, uh, that's why I say, like, it has to be about your joy, which is, is you know, um, because... When, when you say that it's, it is, you know, truly like statistically impossible, it is like maybe 1% of us who have these jobs in the union. Like it truly, it is such a... And that's people in the union. In the union, right? So like it is, it is staggering um, the impossibility of, of, of the dice roll that you're about to do, which doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do it. But yeah, un, like, like you're saying, decoupling that value and understanding that like your job is, is how you eat and how you keep a roof over your head and that you know I, I think where I go with the hobby thing is like fine to call it a hobby but I will always if you are following that passion even like I have a buddy who truly has not acted um, in he hasn't done a major project in years years but he's still taking those acting classes Aww. right he's still he's still reading scripts he's still doing all keeping those things fresh and he has a job that like allows you know that like is a all-consuming job but he's still doing that i still call him an actor right because you are you are engaging in the thing and and no it doesn't pay your bills but it's it's just because it is so hard anyway i just i'm very wary to take that away from someone because it it is it is not earned by by the credits on your resume it's, oh, it's something else a thousand percent also yeah. like Every movie now, half the cast is just the child of someone famous. Are they more of an actor than like someone who's been doing it their whole life in the in you know the quiet background with no accolades? I would say no. Yes. Um, so as kind of a looking forward question before we get into our rapid fire. Um, so I'm 32, yeah. uh, which qualifies me for AARP on YouTube. Um, <laughs> I am old as shit. Uh, you guys are actually as an audience um, on the older side for YouTube, um, but. <laughs> <laughs> drag that. you guys are getting up there uh a little long in the tooth to be watching youtube if you ask me but oh, um Lord. kidding uh no but in all seriousness like i understand just even looking demographically at you know where the audience is where i am even if i am able to like keep and obviously you know we TFD, as you guys know, is much beyond me. We have our whole team. We have other platforms. But as far as the YouTube part of it goes, which is still a big part of what we do, and as far as my show on the channel goes, like, I'm not... I don't know how many more years I got in it mm. um, that, that is even relevant to the audience, but also that is necessarily kind of aligned with, you know, what I'm doing in life, et cetera. Not to make this dark. Mm. But as an actor, mm -hmm. um, I mean, few more youth-obsessed uh, businesses out there. When you look at your career over the next 10 to 20 years, and specifically as it pertains to things like, you know, planning for retirement, like, you know, really building that income um, in a sustainable way, are you afraid? Are you, do you have a plan? Do you feel, what do you, tell me about it, because I think about this all the time. So I think there's, so there's a, there's a phrase going around in our industry, uh, not just the stage sector, but, but the film TV sector as well. Of, of multi-hyphenates, right? And I think that's everywhere. I think multi-hyphenate is like a phrase that's everywhere. I'm not just saying it's just for us. Um, but the idea that you are, and this is what I mean by that passion, right? That you are going to find a way to do this no matter what. And that you enjoy several aspects of this. And there's nothing wrong with just, with just wanting to act. Um, this is a youth-obsessed culture, 100%. That is something that I have, like the idea, right? So uh, the idea that, especially for, for, for women, for female presenting people, right? That you hit a certain age and all of a sudden there's like a, a place where like a no, no person's land where you, you're not hireable is ridiculous. Um, Halle Berry just came, she's coming out with Bruised, which is a movie that she literally was like, 
I think it was meant for a completely different main character. And she was like, cool, no, I want this for a middle-aged black woman. And, I'm gonna, and we're going to rewrite it to that. The fact that she has to do that as opposed to the stories being there is a whole thing that we can get, you know, that's a whole other book. Uh, but I, I, am I afraid of it? No, because for me, this is, there's financial stability and there's the ability to express myself fully. Mm. I am someone who uh, am, I am very fortunate that I've been able to marry the two for a long time. I'm, I, I do not ever take that for granted that what I love to do is also how I make my living. That is an amazing thing. But I also have other interests. I have other things. Again, like I, I, I got through the pandemic because of Ain't Too Proud, because of Hamilton. Uh, and because of teaching, I was teaching at two different schools. Um, there are other ways to engage in this thing beyond just me being front and center of a show. Um, other lucrative ways. Um, so I think that it's less, ab it's, it's less about, again, this kind of imposing point of like, oh, there's a, there's a place where I won't be able to act anymore. And more about just like, and again, talk to me in 10 years, and this might be completely different. But right now, I look at this as a 34-year-old man. I look at this and say, cool, I still get joy from other things. I still, there, you know, there are other things that fulfill me, that that pay me. Um, my writing is, is again, knock on wood, thankfully doing some, some pretty damn good damage. Um, you know, teaching fulfilled me in a way, professorship fulfilled, like, I loved it. I love those kids. I love being able to see the light go off in their head. So just understand that like you contain multitudes. You are not mm. <clears throat> contained by the thing that, that you think you are and adaptability. Um, it was also very, I will say, it was also very helpful, uh, you know, as someone who is, was afraid of financial literacy to get a financial advisor and have them kind of, you know, do your profile and, and see where they think you'll be. And, to hear that was like it really took a, a load off my chest because this is you know this is a again this is a person who's setting up my life insurance setting up all these things and has very just based on what I've done so far has very little concern for my financial welfare right and and knowing and being like oh okay well you're pretty good at your job and if you're not worried about that then that takes the worry off of me and now I'm I'm able to free my mind and be like cool it doesn't have to just be starring on Broadway shows we can do other things. Right. Um, and, and that, I mean, that previous, what you have on your resume is just that in of itself is sort of an investment in your long-term future. Yeah. Also, I mean, we've all seen those charts, right? Like, as a man, you're going to be like 40, 50, 60, and your leading ladies, 20, yep. 22, 21. <laughs> like... Yeah, it's a whole... And that's... So this is a big, a big thing that I am... You know, and again, I was raised by my mother... Um, very much like I, one of my goals is to help combat that. I, I don't, I just don't like that. And it's also just not real. Um, and it's also in the idea that in some executive head, it's not commercially viable is out of control because we just want people, like if there's one thing the pandemic proved, uh, it's that we just want stories. Yes. We just want good stories. Like it doesn't have to be anything like that. Everyone is looking for content right now, and I say that with air quotes because they're really just looking for good, engaging story. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that that happens at any age with any person, and the entire structure that says they have to be this age and look this way and of this gender is out of control and silly. Uh, I, and so I, I try, I'm trying to challenge that in, in as many ways as I can. Next time, when you're going to your next show, you're just going to be like, I'm playing opposite Judy Dench as my love interest, Great. or I'm not taking it. Let me tell hey, hey, I would, uh, in a heartbeat, if, if uh, <laughs> I would be honored to share that state with Judy Dench. Man, I, I'm sure we all went on our Sondheim binges mm -hmm. the other day, and her version of Send in the Clowns, I think, is pretty the best. Pretty beautiful. It's pretty beautiful. It's the best. Oh, yeah. um, okay, so I'm pulling up the. It's the rapid fire question. Yeah. So the time has come, Nick. Um, so these are our rapid fire questions. Very excited. Feel free to pass on any of them. Rapid fire just means whatever comes to your head. Mm -hmm. Quick and dirty. And again, pass if you want. What is the biggest financial secret of your industry? 
that it that you should always ask. So many people think they can't ask. Always ask. When you're negotiating your contracts, yes, there's being thankful. There's being grateful that you have the job. Always ask. Always have your reps ask. Um, what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? <sighs> oh, I'm so cheap about things that I shouldn't be cheap about. <laughs> um, clothes. I'm so cheap I mean, about you're clothes. A man. I know, but I but it also like but I also am in an industry that like truly asks me to like look you know look my best. But like go if if you're watching this, go Google Ham uh, ain't too proud reopening. Look at my cast members. Look how well they were dressed. We're talking like beautiful like you know robes and and hats. And I'm sorry if I can't can I swear? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, I showed up in my Batman graphic tee, a leather jacket, cargo pants, and boots to my reopening, to my Broadway reopening. That is, like, I, I, I and my, my, my wife is trying her damnedest to be like, hey, please just wear, like, you can wear nice things, uh, but it scares me. Uh, I would not fly in my house. Yep, Oof. nope, nope. My and husband it, it, is putting on a suit. Oh, and it doesn't fly in our house either. Like, but she's, <laughs> she's being very kind about it. But, uh, so I don't invest in clothes. I do invest in uh, theme parks. It took me a second for that. I was like, what's a theme park? Whoa, you mean like Six Flags? I mean like like we go to Walt Disney World or uh, or uh, Universal uh, every year. Uh, what has been your best investment, single best investment? Financial or otherwise? Um, otherwise. It could be any. Some people say their wives. I, I was going to say, well, I was going to say my wife, but I was oh. definitely going to say my wife. Uh, mental health. My mental yeah. health. Yeah. We, he was saying before we, he's got to go to therapy before his uh, show. We, oh, yeah. we stand a therapy going king. That is what we're doing. Um, what has been your biggest money mistake and why? <sighs> Not communicating about mm. about financial decisions, uh, especially when you're when you're married, especially when you have a partner. Um, you know, again, I get scared that I'm not doing the right thing and understanding that there is no right and wrong. There's just decisions. There's just choices. And being clear about those choices uh, will save you so much heartache. So, um, yeah, all just the times when I just, I got, I froze up and was like, you know, again, my anxiety was just like, oh, just, just do it and, and don't worry about it and don't tell her. As opposed to, hey, slow down, breathe. You actually can figure that you're not alone. You can figure this out together. Uh, you can go back and watch the deep cuts of financial diet, uh, yeah. you know, and just figure it out. And that that absolutely is the biggest mistake. I think I'm a fan of your wife after this interview. She, she is a fan great. of yours. Ooh. I'll tell you. She and maybe one day we'll meet. Oh, I she, let me tell you that will. Oh my make God, her smile. is a double brunch date brewing? Uh, please. What is happening? Brunch. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. What is your biggest current money insecurity? Hmm. It's got to be the Omicron variant shutting down Broadway again, because that's my biggest money insecurity it's, for I mean, you. Yeah, but you know, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Be real. No, the Omarion variant is a huge thing. <laughs> uh, but you know, you know what it is. It's it's definitely. I wouldn't even say that the Broadway shut down. I would say, uh, you talk about the, the the insecurity of my career and just like what it means to be getting older in this industry. Just the idea that, like, the next thing won't happen before this thing ends. I've been very, Ooh. I've been very fortunate where truly there has, even in the pandemic, there was, n there's never been a pause in employment. That's big. It's like, and I'm, and, and I, like, truly, I, I don't give myself, and, uh, you know, again, self love is a, is a, is a, oh my God, thing. This is the safe space to yes. boost yourself up. And, and to understand that, like, yeah, I've made my living in this industry 10 years straight. Not, I have never, ever been out of work. And even if I was out of work, I always knew the next thing coming. Um, and that was truth, like, again, through the pandemic. But that still is the biggest concern is that, you know, again, Broadway shows, you know, if they last a year, you're so lucky. I'm in a show that is that has lasted already more than a year, um, but like, 
wanting to continue to climb, wanting to continue to do the things, you know, whether it's booking another Broadway show or, uh, you know, the, one of the things I'm developing um, on the writing side, taking off, getting greenlit, all these things. Um, I, that's the big concern. It's like, God, what happens if? But it's like, also, I have to trust that, like, again, your track record's, your track record's not that bad. Uh, even if it doesn't happen, you'll be okay. So, yeah. And I'm imagining you're in one of those roles where you're not allowed to have facial hair. Not. And you have to have, like, a very specific grooming regimen. So, you know, maybe if you have a pause, the silver lining will be... I can get that beard back. Uh, you can do whatever you want. I'm, I miss that beard. Yeah. And you can eat as much cereal as you want. Yay. Um, what has been the financial habit that's helped you the most? Planning. Hell yeah. When did you first feel successful? Quote. And mm-hmm. what does that word mean to you? It would be so funny if you were like, when I was starring as Aaron Burr on Hamilton and not a moment before, everything else before that was failure. No, you know, so this is a, this is a story. <laughs> it, it actually does have to do with Aaron Burr, but it was, it was a story. Uh, I'll try to make this concise because I know it's rapid fire, but this is, this is again, <laughs> story. So when I was a kid, uh, the first, one of the first plays I saw on Broadway was Julius Caesar. And it was starring Denzel Washington as Brutus. And there's uh, an actor named Kelly Acoin. Um, who was Au-quan. there? Aquan. 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 I'm just hearing it, and I'm like, is she French? Is it Aquan? It is. It is. Uh, I don't know if Kelly's French, and it's it's him. Uh, he's on. Uh, if you know the show Billions, uh, I do. He, uh, plays Dollar Bill. Uh, I love that show. He's a, he's a brilliant actor, but he was starring as uh, Octavius Caesar. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was a huge Shakespeare nerd, and I had all these questions. Um, so I waited outside the stage door, and. Uh, you know, again, Denzel came out of the stage door and everyone swarmed him and, you know, whatever. And I was never going to get my questions answered by him. Uh, not in a million years. But Kelly came out the stage door. And uh, he, you know, he, again, Octavius Caesar's a lead part, but not, not the biggest part in that show. Uh, but he, it was a two-show day, matinee. That means you have a show in two hours after you finish your first show. Ugh. He was clearly going to get some dinner. I had some asinine question about his character. And that man stopped to talk to me for 30 minutes. A little 13-year-old. And when I got Aaron Burr, um, I made a deal with myself that I would never not stage door. I would always do the stage door. And I tweeted at him. And I was like, I just want you to know that I do it because of you. And he tweeted back at me. And then we became like like internet friends. And then, you know, and that, that grew and grew. That was the moment. When I, when I, when I, when, when I was able to go out and do that same service for somebody else that's when i was like oh wow yeah this is this is a big thing um so yeah that was the moment what a beautiful answer that's so sweet Mm. oh well as i knew it would be this has been a pleasure although i have to say i was surprised by your level of candor about finances i was not expecting it in a good way yeah it's it's for i will say like again i uh, if, if I'm not breaching a contract, which I'm not, right, to, to, to talk about this kind of stuff, I think it's super important. I think for anybody trying to be an actor, be in this business, please know what's at stake. Like, I will say, like, the, the, the amount of money that I'm making now, pretty pretty average pay, um, right, for, for a Broadway principal. It, it, a lot of Broadway principals are making less than that, right? So, like, this is still on the higher end end of things as crazy as that sounds and then when you get into celebrities it's a whole different thing right they're making a completely different scale so like but we got to know this because we got to be able to plan um you know so i i'm always about uh candor when it comes to comes to the stuff also because i don't know a whole lot so i always want to learn and the only way to learn is to ask questions and be real so yeah I love that. New York City needs you to go see these shows. It's true. Stop being selfish and not seeing them. I don't care if you don't have the money. Mm-hmm. Steal it. Steal it. Steal money. Steal Please the money. It. But don't steal the, t- the, the seats. Don't steal the no. tickets. Steal no. the money from someone else. Buy the tickets. <laughs> and then go to it. Uh, no, but his, his show is amazing. And where can people find you online? Uh, I'm at Nikki Walks, N-I-K-K-Y-W-A-L-K-S, on Twitter and, and Instagram. Uh... And yeah, from there you can find my me, my show, uh, Ain't Too Proud, uh, my, my movie podcast, Little Justice, uh, all the things that I'm doing and working on are all through that. So yeah. And YouTube search his version of Gethsemane from oh God. JCC. Oh dear JCS. God. Uh, JCCS. JCC. Either way. I love it. JCS. 
JCS, JCS. <laughs> what is wrong with me today? Perfect. It's late. Anyway, thank you so much for joining. Of course. And thank you guys for tuning in. And we will see you next week on a brand new episode of The Financial Confessions. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.